<clears throat> the Ministry of Health, Social and Community Development, Culture and Gender Affairs is pleased to participate in this very important exercise. The theme, the green economy, a pathway towards a sustainable future is thought provoking and we in the ministry give it the green light. According to the 2011-2012 Health Situation Report, the quality of life in the Federation is such that we are classified by the United Nations as having high human development, with indicators above the regional average. The usual measures of health system performance are favorable. Life expectancy increased from 67 years in 1990 to 75 years in 2012. Infant mortality or the number infant deaths per 1,000 live, live births decreased from 28 in 1990 to 9 in 2012. And maternal mortality continues to be rare, remaining at less than five deaths every five years since the 1970s. Indeed, the health system, which I have the privilege to lead, continues to make a stellar contribution to quality of life, personal productivity, and national development. We recently opened our dialysis unit, and within the next two months, we hope to launch our national health scheme to address the issue of health costs. This, we believe, will have a positive effect on productivity, reducing the hours lost through ill health, it will also have a positive effect on the well-being of our people, on poverty, as it is well known that many of our people who lived reasonably comfortable lives are thrust into poverty when they are diagnosed with chronic diseases such as cancer. The cost of the treatment often depletes their savings and leaves them and their families emotionally and financially drained. The National Health Scheme will also reduce the cost spent on health out of the national budget as the services and procedures that are now paid for by the state will be covered by insurance. However, as a small island East Caribbean state, the Federation faces unrelenting threats to its development and well-being. They are largely external in origin and beyond our control. Ours is a small economy with open borders. By definition, we are therefore very vulnerable to instability in the global food, fuel, and finance markets. Inflation is largely imported because we lack the scale to negotiate favorable terms from external suppliers. A US government debt default or government shutdown, as happened recently, can deal a major blow to our economy tourism being the main driver of our economy. Additionally, we are victims of sea level rise associated with climate change and global warming to which we do not contribute. 
we must be concerned about the health of the coral reefs and beaches because they are critical factors in food production, tourism promotion, recreation, and general health. The interconnectedness and rapidity of global travel market makes it easy for new and known infections to travel the world in a few hours. <clears throat> This is a critical area for tourism because governments of our source markets do issue regular travel health advisories to their citizens. If a disease outbreak in the Federation goes viral in social and other media, expect a drop in visitor arrivals by air and perhaps the diversion of cruise ships to other destinations. We in the Ministry of Health take cognizance of the fact that our tourism can be affected by the quality of our health service. We see many cruise passengers at JNF. It's only last week when I visited I was taken to a young lady off of a cruise ship who had to have emergency surgery, I think to do with appendicitis. What I would usually do in those cases is visit them, identify myself as the Minister of Health, find out how they're doing, etc., because it goes a long way towards helping our tourism product. So any pathway to a sustainable future must have as stepping stones structural resilience, increasing food and energy security, and affordable and accessible and quality health care. Because added to these vulnerabilities is our susceptibility to natural disasters such as earthquakes and hurricanes. If heaven forbid, we should be struck by a really big one. What we have accomplished since universal adult suffrage in 1952 may disappear in less than a day. My ministry supports the Green Economy Initiative because we see it as an opportunity According to the United Nations Environment Program, green economy means activities that result in improved human well-being and social equity, while significantly reducing environmental risks and ecological scarcities. A green economy approach to sustainable development means a more holistic and participatory approach to national governance and to public policy making implementation and performance assessment. And so we commend the Ministry of Finance for this, their ninth consultation on the economy. Green economy policies will, by definition, mean attention to energy independence and food security, and also greater vigilance to ensure that the correct balance is struck between the health of the environment on the one hand and development needs on the other. Having said that, I believe environmentally sensitive physical development is possible, but government must ensure that all interests and appropriate regulations are taken into account. The UNEP definition of the green economy speaks to improving equity and well-being. Social equity, meaning barrier-free access to health, education, and social protection services based on need, is under serious threat due to the high rates of non-communicable diseases 
in the Federation. 70% of our debts are as a result of chronic non-communicable diseases. Clearly, our NCD profile is socially and economically unsustainable. We need a green economy mindset to stimulate higher levels of food security and a greater sense of personal responsibility, self-reliance, and resilience when it comes to our health and the health of the environment. While social equity and environmental sustainability are primary remits of my ministry, I am pleased to report that portfolio subjects under my watch are already green in their orientation and direction in close conjunction with other sectors. My ministry is represented on the Development and Planning Control Board and the Pesticides and Toxic Chemicals Control Board. Those two boards are mentioned to underscore the point that my government is aware of the negative health effects of rapacious development and the border that is porous to chemicals. There are other successful examples of intersectoral action. Human health and veterinary health maintain a close working relationship because respiratory viruses, such as influenza, move easily between humans and animals. The water sector is supported by health to ensure the consistent delivery of potable water. Obesity, anemia, and school underperformance are signs of nutritional deficiency. We have joined with the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Agriculture, along with the McGill University, to pilot the project which will see a more nutritious school means menu which will directly involve our farmers. This project is called the Farm to Fork project. You'd notice the name Farm to Fork because of the direct relationship with local farmers. The Environmental Health Department, the Solid Waste Management Corporation, and the Parks and Beaches Unit are very active in maintaining high levels of hygiene, sanitation, green space landscaping, and proper drainage. However, we need the support of the Ministry of Finance as we need to employ more port health officers to protect our borders from the entry of unhealthy goods and to purchase and maintain the inventories of equipment and supplies of waste management, green space landscaping, and beach cleanliness. Around mid-September, the Solid Waste Management Corporation introduced the Baylor system, which is the first step on the way to waste to energy projects. As usual, we in St. Kitts and Nevis lead the OECS and indeed the Caribbean as being the first to introduce the Baylor technology. The Baylor technology responds favorably to the trend of improving the safety and security of the occupational environment. Noise levels and other occupational nuisances such as dust and wind-strewn garbage are reduced to a minimum to the comfort and convenience of workers and the neighboring residents alike. The green economy implies turning garbage from a waste to a resource. This trend is accomplished by the Baylor system through its capacity to take the entire 130 tons of waste and more deposited on a daily basis at the Connery landfill and convert that waste into energy. It is estimated 
that this resource transformation can introduce an additional seven megawatts of electricity into the national grid on a daily basis. This would be renewable, non-fossil energy, thereby reducing our reliance on fossil fuel and further positively impacting the economy by eliminating the cost formerly associated with acquiring this energy. On the other side of the ministry, social equity means the implementation of a social protection strategy that is targeted to those who are most in need. Following a World Bank report on social safety nets programs in the OECS in 2011, I think, it was noted that we in St. Kitts and Nevis had the most social safety nets. But the system needed to be reformed so that it properly targets those who are most vulnerable. We set out with the other OECS countries to reform our social safety nets program. I am pleased to report that last evening, right here at the Marriott, we launched our national social protection strategy, the first in the OECS to do so. This would better target those who are most in need and would shift the focus from welfare to investment. The focus will also shift from the individual to the family. There will be a co-responsibility agreement with families in an integrated and holistic social assistance program. This means that when families receive benefits, family members are expected to meet targets such as annual checkups, ensuring that children attend schools. We have many reports of the school uniform program going to waste because parents don't show up for the school uniforms which are given out to the schools. Schools report sometimes a month after school is open, the uniforms are still there. So we have to put in this co-responsibility so that we can ensure that the children are really benefiting from programs such as the school uniform program. Participation in workshops about parenting, budgeting, family planning, and participation in labor market intervention programs designed to generate employment. They will receive bank cards in the new system so that they can access funds at bank machines and other facilities. This is part of our effort to modernize the system. Another major focus is our children. The New Horizons Center will see its first residence by next month. Right now, the staff is under training because you would be aware that these are very sensitive areas and so the staff has to be properly trained to deal with the residents who would be there so that they'll be properly taken care of. The center addresses at-risk youth who come into conflict with the law. This will ensure that we have no children in prison. We are moving from a punitive system to a rehabilitative system. Classes will be organized for them, and so they'll be able to continue their education. They'll be able to have days when they can meet with their family so that at the end of the day, they can be properly reintegrated into their families and into their communities. I wish to invite you, all of you today, to Independence Square at 3 p.m. this afternoon for the launch of the Blue Bear Program. This is to the Department of Child Protection. 
where we will launch a program breaking the silence and the sexual abuse of our children. This, as you know, is a huge problem for us. Social equity means a greater focus on gender equality. Our women need greater financial and educational assistance, and I'm not referring here to formal education, by the way, because we're well educated formally, to address the vast disparity in income. The leadership gap should also be addressed if we are truly serious about our development. Men's health requires sharper focus, and we must continue to find solutions to the problem of school dropouts and young boys. We've already started to address that. As you know, there are some pilot programs in primary schools where boys are put together to see if this would better aid them in their education process. I'll remind you that on the 19th, the 19th of November is International Men's Day, and our department is already looking towards seeing how we could incorporate our men in that program. So we're looking forward for your support. <laughs> Finally, the green economy must involve and address development of our cultural industries. Mrs. Hazel, you're looking for things for the budget? Hint, children, cultural industries. We have a cultural registry right now being prepared so that all of our artists, you can go online and access them in case you need them to perform anywhere. And so we're encouraging all of our artists, wherever they are in the world, to get onto this cultural register. The cultural policy is now in its final stage and will soon be put before the cabinet. We hope that our artists could be given greater assistance so that many more of them can become, can become self-sufficient, thus adding to increased employment, especially among our young people. In tough times, people and nations either innovate or perish. My government continuously demonstrates that it has the political will to chart a new developmental course when circumstances warrant such bold action. Indeed, we are at yet another inflection point in our history. We had a similar inflection point in 2006 when sugar was the sugar industry was closed because of indebtedness, knowing that its indebtedness was unsustainable. This triggered the post-sugar adaptation strategy. And I wish to refer you to a book by the winner of Nobel Prize in Economics, Michael Spence, called The Future of economic growth in a multi-speed world. I think we all should have get copies of this. It's very simple to read and can give you much insight. I bought this book on an airport and in flying in the plane I started reading it and to my pleasant surprise at page 77, Michael Spence, Nobel Prize winner in economics says, these decisions, and he was speaking about the importance of political will in development. He says, these decisions can be tough. In 2008, the government of St. Kitts in the Eastern Caribbean decided to withdraw the subsidy to the sugarcane industry on the island. It was costing the government, look at you saying, 60 million a year to keep it in business with no evidence that the level of the subsidy would decline over time. But the sugarcane industry was the major source of employment on the island. It was a difficult and courageous decision. The government knew there would be short-term pain, but also knew that the longer-term growth and prosperity 
depended on shifting the structural characteristic of the island's economy. And today, we want to compliment our Prime Minister and the government for making that bold move so that today we are once again on a path to economic growth. Today's consultation is about another adaptation strategy, the green economy. I am looking forward to the results in 2020 or before. There must be a 50% or more reduction in our use of fossil fuels. Our nation must be powered by green energy, including green energy generated from landfill waste. By 2020, we must have greater food security with the farm to fork movement of locally produced food so that obesity rates can decrease by 25% at least, and healthcare spending is neither excessive nor bankrupting. I wish this consultation well. My ministry looks forward to continuing the journey towards a green economy and sustainable development with other government and non-government sectors, but at a higher level of performance. The road we must travel is paved with social equity economic development, the health of the environment, and the health and well-being of our people. Thank you.